Because very often you go to a restaurant and they say, no, the kitchen is closed already. <laughs> yes, uh, the last time we were in Berlin, of course, day one finished <coughs> around 2 a.m. Yeah, see, I, this is one of those things that I don't even remember. I just like push it in the back of my head so I, I don't have to, um, don't have the callback available to me. So I cannot be depressed about it. So uh, it looks like Marco's turn has finished there with Firewall, Co-Links to Goblin and Ib. So all of those monsters having effects that will be boosted by those Co-Links. Mm. Yeah, and of course Christian is double checking everything here. He, he did go up against World Chalice before, as we pointed out, but chances are that the World Chalice player he, he played against in round number one is not as experienced as uh, Marco Perico. I can actually look up if he's still in competition, just to, to get an idea. It was Nicolas de Vila. And, oh, well, he, he went all the way on the first he's, day. Yeah, he's still in for round nine. Not on... Uh, Got one loss, two losses. Oh no, uh, three he, he plays up to round eight only. <coughs> yeah, he just played until the end of the day. He had three losses and one draw, so not successful enough to stay in competition for today. But um, well, well done to you, sir. You you finished the first day. Do we have any uh, of the stats available on the decks that have made it through to day two? Yes, but I think that's something we should uh, talk a little bit more about after the match because then we can bring up those statistics for you guys to also see what's happening. Um, let's just say some of the things we said yesterday are no longer true. Ye yesterday, one of the big stories was that um, the in terms of relative numbers, the amount of decks that were uh, represented in the field didn't really change. Like the the meta game breakdown of start uh, start of round one was almost identical to the meta game breakdown at the end of round or at the start of round eight, which is uh, something we don't have very often. Now that the cut has been performed, it's a bit of a different picture, of course, because even if um, most of the Sky Striker Trickstar players made it to the end of day one, if they don't make the cut for day two, suddenly the entire um, statistics look a little bit upside down. Here we see. Uh Christian Langer in his battle phase has just attacked over the Nightmare Goblin, triggering the effect of Firewall to special summon another monster from hand. So how good is this field looking on Marco's side? Because uh, very often we see fields with like four, five, six monsters even. Um, here we only have three. It's not the end board that Marco would have been hoping to produce, but it might just be enough that with that firewall uh, return to hand effect, he could be able to have an interruption at a key moment if he needs to. Uh, and he's just trying to make sure that Langer doesn't put out anything that is beyond what he's able to deal with. Okay. So he's trying to play it cool. Yeah, and with a new turn, a new card drawn, and a new normal summon, he'll have a lot more options available to him. Okay. Well, it seems like he made it through his opponent's turn after those uh, three face-down cards in the back row of Christian Lange. There we have, um, we can bring that up for you guys, with the Space Typhoon, Scapegoat, and a Trickster Reincarnation. Yeah, the Reincarnation being flipped immediately. Uh, he will have good knowledge of what's in uh, Marco's hand at the moment. So he wants to just take everything out. Oh, and there's a Twin Twister that Marco drew for the turn. He can just chain that and force the activation of both MST and the scapegoat. So uh, no real value coming out from that Twin Twisters, but he'll still be happy with it for having revealed those face downs. He doesn't have to yep. worry about any cards. Yeah, and also, I mean, it takes slightly less burn damage, um, gets less cards banished from his, uh, from his hand, of course. It's not super important, but I think uh, that, that worked out pretty well for Marco. Could have been so much worse. Yes, yeah, certainly uh, Marco, not knowing what those face downs were, was absolutely correct to chain his Twin Twisters mm -hmm. there. If they'd been uh, cards like Mind Crush or anything that will really interact with his turn, he doesn't want them sitting around on the field. Yeah. Marco starting to use his graveyard like a hand here. Banishes the World Legacy World Chalice and searches a World Legacy Succession from the deck. 
So has Marco's position improved here or would you say not much has changed? I think Marco is looking in a fairly good spot. Uh, I don't know exactly what's sat in his graveyard right now, but he just keeps getting more and more cards from that second hand of his and placing them out onto the table. <laughs> and uh, judging by the facial, facial expressions, Christian Lange doesn't look all too amused here. Marco Perico, on the other hand, look, looks a little bit like nonplussed. He doesn't seem phased at all. Marco, yeah, looks like he's just going through the motions. He doesn't have the ideal hand that he was hoping for, but he's got plays, so he'll just go through one by one, trying to eat away at resources. Christian just considering here whether he wants to use the Ash Blossom to negate that Nightmare Cerberus. He goes for it, doesn't want to allow Perico the draw, and of course keeps his Licorice on the field, but that feels a bit of a secondary consideration to denying the draw. He knows uh, he's played already against World Chalice, so he likely knows what the deck can do, mm -hmm. and he just wants to deny any additional resources wherever he can. That sounds like a neat strategy in general. Like, if you, if you don't know exactly what to do, um, making sure your opponent has as few resources as possible is, generally speaking, a pretty good idea. Yeah, absolutely. Particularly in a situation like this, where we see that Marco isn't able to make the plays that we know that that World Chalice deck is capable of, and so any additional car might make the difference. In a deck like Gouki, where it's quite likely that the player will already have the pieces that they need to make an Assault combo, one extra card, not such a huge difference when they've already got a board that's coming together. Here, each additional card is sort of mm. teetering on the brink of going for the full combo. <laughs> okay. Living on the edge. And here it is, the World Legacy su Succession. <laughs> succession, my god, why is it, that card name so hard? And again, Christian Lange is not looking happy here. Now we have four monsters on Marco Perico's side. And that's going to take out a lot of monsters or scapegoats. Still monsters. It'll be interesting to see here. Uh, whether Marco will use the effect of his Ningursu in the main phase 2 to take that last monster off the field. It's actually quite a consideration against a uh, Sky Striker deck of any sort whether or not you want to leave them with no monsters in their main monster zones. Mm, right. He opted for the alternative of just leaving that monster on the field. Yeah, and that actually puts uh, Langer in a tough position where Two of the cards in his hand cannot be activated mm. until he can clear those main monster zones. So quite a smart move by Marco Perico. Um, is it smarter to uh, leave the trickster monster on the field rather than token? Uh, I'm not sure it makes a huge difference here, but I think Mark uh, Langer maybe have access to a firewall loop combo here. Uh, right. I don't know for certain whether the firewall dragon for Marco has been used. If it hasn't, then uh, Langer can't launch into that knowing that he could be interrupted at any point. But mm -hmm. if the Firewall has been used, then there's definitely uh, a way through for the Lily Bell combo. So that's an entirely new consideration that we need to go through here. Yes, uh, although I don't think that the line that he took would allow him to do so even if that firewall hadn't been used. Mm. If the firewall was as yet unused, he could have searched for a light stage, uh, made a link to with um, his Licorice and Candina, play two Hornet drones as two chain links for two tokens, and then there's firewall, light stage for the Lily Bell, and all of the pieces would be there. But uh, if, as we think might be the case, the firewall is as yet just sitting there it, unused. It, it should still be live, yeah. Okay. It should. I'm not 100%, but uh, um, I don't remember what he would have uh, used it on. I don't, I don't think there was anything he used it on. I, yeah, I, we, were, we were discussing stats uh, on the turn when Marco first summoned it, so I don't know if he's still sat there. Yes, it looks like he's activating the effect now, so uh, Christian couldn't make that play. Yeah. So good for Marco, not forgetting about the effects of his cards. <laughs> and... Um, that, I mean, the, on the bright side, Hornet Drones is now alive. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, I don't think that Christian Lange can be too happy with the outcome here. No, without any um, Sky Striker Mobilize Engage in Grave, 
He's only going to be able to add back a Hornet drones here, which doesn't leave him with a lot of options. If he had the engage, he would be able to activate it, take mm. a search, and yep. possibly get something off the draw as well. Right, of course. <laughs> Now, we know that there is uh, one Trickstar Reincarnation in Grave for Langer at this point. That is correct. We can bring up the graveyard for you guys as well. This is what it looks like. It just barely fits on one screen here. And also shows, like, he did have some key cards, but he's, he's basically missing the second part of his deck archetype. Like, he's got the Trickstar engine, but he's, he's missing out on the Sky Striker cards, really. Yeah, it does seem that way. Uh, the Hornet Drones sort of gets his Sky Striker mm. things going, but without Engage, he doesn't get the advantage of activating all of his effects. Right. And we don't see pure Trickstar that often anymore, right? Uh, it's become a much less popular deck, certainly. Yeah. It's, it's not even in our metagame breakdown in the top seven decks. But so far, um, flawless execution from Marco Perico, as far as I can tell, at least. Yeah, um, all of the plays that we've seen so far have seemed to be... If, if you were thinking about how do I play World Chalice, this is, um, this is a nice little guide you have here, visual guide with some additional commentary. Uh, this is how you do it. And he didn't have a good opening hand, if you remember. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't terrible, but it, wasn't, it certainly wasn't great. Uh, no, um, I'm just wondering here if uh, Christian could have possibly made his way through to the firewall combo this turn. Uh, I don't know if there, there might have been a line for him if he'd gone for the Nightmare Cerberus rather than the Nightmare Unicorn mm -hmm. to take out that firewall dragon. He could have then activated the one remaining Hornet drones in hand for Kagari. Uh, no, I, yeah, I don't think he quite has, he would have one resource too few mm. whichever way you cut it. <coughs> But it's interesting that there are so many ways that, that lead to Rome. In this case, Rome is a gigantic dragon <laughs> that can bring back some of your monsters or help you bring back some of your monsters. Yeah, and in the, the summoning restrictions for Firewall being so open, no limitation on the names used, no limitation on uh, whether they're, they are effect monsters, mm. only requiring a minimum of two different monsters for that link summon. It's Whatever link climb plays you go through, you always have access to Firewall at 4. Oh, by the way, we have a comment on the stream that says um, all of the names were Cerberus protected. Uh, of course, Marco, Marco's uh, guys. They were under the protection of Cerberus, so... Couldn't be destroyed by card effects. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that's correct. That, that's also something to... It's so easy to forget about these effects that are all interacting in various ways. Uh, half the time, you know, like... Okay, th I need to look out for this, I need to look out for this, and then there's like two more effects on the field and like, oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. So this looks to me like uh, the judges have interfered in this match right now. And um, I think it might be... I, I, I think the, the reasoning is that Christian has been asking what the cards are doing for, for a couple of times now. And um, for that reason, he's been taking a little bit longer. Th that's a very fine line to walk, um, to, to balance that, especially as a judge, of, of course, where you're like, okay, is he trying to be, s is he trying to play slowly? Is it on purpose? Is it by accident? Uh, when do I draw the line? When do I award a warning or not? I, I feel like it would depend for me which cards he is asking about. If it's the, the Goki monsters or the Firewall Dragon, you expect him to know those. But perhaps the World Chalice cards, Slightly less well known, and it would be reasonable to expect that he might want clarification on those yeah. effects. Yeah, <laughs> the, the kind of the problem is um, he um, he's asking if a card is doing this and this, and he's correct every time. So that looks then suspicious to the judges. And it's just the player like getting a, a confirmation that he's not walking into something. Yeah, I I would side with the player in that regard, in that even if you think you know the card text. You always want that clarification in case you're not certain, because this is not the stage you want to be wrong yeah, about yeah. Uh, a piece of interaction like, like that. You, you don't want to be like, oh, I don't need to ask about this. I I know this. I know this deck, and then you you mess something up, and that's how you get knocked out of the tournament. And and we have seen that actually. We have seen that in the past, and it's it's not a nice view. Somebody is like, yeah, I didn't want to ask, so my friends would would tell me I'm a 
I'm, I'm a novice player. When I walked up to them after the match, like, oh, you don't know what this card is doing? And then he gets knocked out of the tournament and he's like, oh, I should have asked. Yeah, absolutely. It, and you, you wouldn't be able to, to look at your own feature match at that point. Oh, yeah. Remembering, oh, I, I was thinking, should I ask, should I not? You, yeah. you always need to know what your opponent's it's, cards yeah. do unless you know for certain. Absolutely. All right. Marco's looking in a very good place right now. He's got that firewall back onto the field after it was returned by uh, mm -hmm. the Nightmare Unicorn for Christian Lange. He can summon another Imduk above or a Link Spider. Sure. That works. Now, even better than the Imduk here, giving a second co-link to the Firewall Dragon. This one, a new copy summoned from the extra deck, has its effect live again. So here we will have seen the effect of Firewall to summon from hand, activated it as Chainlink 1. And it looks like he might be using the effect to return cards to hand as Chainlink 2, right. possibly giving him some better options for what to summon out with that first effect. So is he, is he setting something up like a gigantic turn of attacks? Could this be already the last turn? Or is the World Chalice deck something that is like a little bit more grindy, needs a few more turns and, and strips the opponent of their options? Um, the World Chalice deck, I assume here, will be able to put out a comfortable 8,000 damage. But we have to remember that Christian has access to the Trickstar Reincarnation Engrave. So he's got a lot of mm. wool that can be built. So he could banish to summon the Lily Bell from his grave. I believe he also has a Licorice in hand. So if he needs to, he could then afterwards return that Lily Bell to hand to summon the Licorice, summon out the Lily Belt again in defense position just to really block some damage. I'm not sure if that would be good enough for him right? because he's going to be top decking into a big wall of monsters, but I think it's unlikely that we'll see enough damage to right. completely seal the game this turn. So those are all things that you need to take into consideration. It's one of the few times when it really pays out to check your opponent's graveyard. Yes. Sometimes you're like, ah, oh, it almost feels like this is only being done uh, for, for time purposes, to, to get a little bit more time to think about your next play. In this particular scenario, it would make perfect sense to check the graveyard and you're actually learning something yeah. about the game. Interestingly, Marco the only fielding 7,800 damage, so he's not even going to force out yeah, six the... Uh, um, um, my mistake? Uh, yeah, 5,000 from the Firewall and the Driver, and then 1,800 from mm -hmm. Ib. Yeah, so he doesn't force the activation in Grave. You don't seem to agree with that. Uh, I don't know if perhaps he could have made another play to push for more damage, but just making any sort of play to force your opponent to activate their cards on your terms mm -hmm. can often be the right way to gain the upper hand in a situation like this. So Christian Lange is left with a Candina in hand, and he gets to Surge. But he doesn't find anything, and that means that Marco Perico wins the first duel of the second day after 23 minutes. Quite the thriller we got here. But he co continues his win streak with World Chalice after the impressive, impressive victory at YCS Bochum. Yes, and now we're going to be seeing what can happen if Christian is able to play first. What do we have in the side decks for these players? Yeah, so uh, Christian has a few more mech knights. We can see blue sky, indigo, blue... It's, yes, it's the typical four mech knight package in the side deck for Christian. He has one blue sky, two purple nightfall, and one indigo mm. eclipse. And then he's got one copy of Ash Blossom, Choice Spring, two... Uh, that's Ghost... Ghost Maiden and Maiden. Haunted Mansion. Right. Unending Nightmare, Mind Control, Winged Dragon of Ra's Fear Mode, which is good against the Goki deck, but not so much. Well, it's very strong here, actually. I was about to say, yeah, because Matt also pointed out uh, World Chalice is like a discount Goki almost. Um, so that could also come in here. The Winged Dragon of Ra Sphere Mode, I would certainly expect to see for Game 3, if uh, Christian is able to win this one. Uh -huh. Less of an attractive option when you're playing first, okay. as yeah. it's only a card that will do anything once your opponent has made some plays. Right. We don't see an evenly matched here. Um, not super surprising. That that card has also not made as much of an exp um, 
impression this weekend so far? No, it's fallen away a significant amount uh, because the decks that you'd really want to play it against, like Gouki, mm -hmm. they often end with Trigate Wizard. Yeah. So it's really only a Winged Dragon of Rast Fear mode that can break through that full extra link board. I think we haven't seen that card in action a single time this weekend. We came ever so close yes. uh, with our Light Sworn player playing his one copy of Evenly Matched, but uh, dragged unfortunately down. dragged down, yeah. ruined the story for us. That's true, yeah. That, that match would have been a lot more better in terms of uh, for coverage. It would have looked a lot more like a highlight reel match when, when that uh, hadn't happened, that had dragged down. All right, let's look at the side deck of Marco Perico. We have uh, three copies of Ghost Ogre. Troll and Lockbird, two copies there. Troll and Lockbird is certainly likely to be coming in here with all of the searches from Trick Star Sky Striker with the Engage, Terraforming in the Light Stage, in the Cantina. There are huge options to shut down. He's playing Psy Blocker, which I find interesting. Psy Blocker is a very interesting card, uh, particularly for a matchup like Gouki. You can special summon it from hand with a Firewall once you're halfway through resolving your combo. It's just any monster that you can use for a link, yeah. but whilst it blinks onto the board momentarily, mm. you just say, oh, and for the next turn, you cannot use your Assault. Yeah. It, I, I think if you really know um, about the important cards in the various decks, this could be really, really important card. Yeah. Uh, interestingly enough, he's playing one uh, Kaiju, Gamesiel, um, because we haven't seen those either the, this entire weekend. So uh, Gamesiel is another big opening turn play for the... Uh, World Chalice deck. Mm -hmm. uh, unlike most decks which would put in their Kaijus when they're playing second to mm. take out the opponent's board, World Chalice plays them when they play first to summon out to their side of the field and use Kyoto Waterfront to accumulate those Kaiju counters and have multiple negations ready for the opponent's right. first turn. Okay, well, we got the hands loading in. Christian Langer is allowed to go first and that looks like a good opening hand. Oh, is he not going first? That's surprising. Perhaps he thinks that he's better off siding into all of his hand traps and the Winged Dragons of Ra and trying to deny Marco access to that sixth card. But especially with that opening hand, with Scapegoat, he's got an engage, uh, he's got a light stage. He, there, there are places he could go. I think if you see those opening five, you regret the decision of not going first. Oh, absolutely. He has no hand traps, he has no sphere mode. I think he's going to sit there regretting his decision and watching as Marco builds a full World Chalice board. The only slight advantage that he has here is that Marco might not have chosen to side in his most powerful mm. lock cards yep. for when he is able to play first, but I don't think that's going to matter a great deal. We're still going to see a huge World Chalice board being assembled here. Yeah, Marco is not going to be like super mad about that. Uh, here we get to see a little bit more of his deck while he's searching, just a little bit more. Um, it's kind of hard to make out under the lights. Yeah, I don't think he will have sided in the uh, the Archlord the, Christia right. or the Gamesiel or the Kyoto Waterfronts. Probably no Sly Blocker. He'll be set up with uh, cards like Hatrunade and additional hand traps to try and prevent the mm -hmm. uh, Trickstar combos from resolving. I mean, he did draw into one hand trap, but the Drawlin Lockbird. I think he already had... No, he had in a side deck. So he sided those in. So in a tiny little way, his deck got a little bit worse for going first. Tiny. But, uh, yeah. yeah. But uh, it doesn't seem like it matters that much. I don't think Marco's upset about being no, told to go first. Ex exactly. Yeah. I think he will have been sat there thinking, wow, really? He's okay, like, then. <laughs> he's like, that's a nice surprise. Okay. So we see the mystical shine balls on the field. And this is autopilot. This is as autopiloty as it gets, actually. Yeah. For him, for him. I'm not saying like everybody could do this, but he's like, yeah, I've I've done this. Yep. He knows the combos from here. He knows exactly where he's going. The only slight frustration is he's sat here thinking, hmm, I could have done this very differently if I'd known I was <laughs> going to be playing first. But uh, <laughs> yeah, he's uh, he's not going to worry about that. Not no. up, not after the um, result entry slip has been signed. No, once, not at all. Once he's marked as the winner and the judge collected it, he's <laughs> going to be like, okay, now now I can stop worrying about those decisions. Yeah. But you have to kind of wonder, like, what's Christian Lange's strategy? Did he think that... Um, I mean, yes, if if he draws into the the, um, the Winged Dragon of Ra's Fear mode, um, he could still turn this around. But what are the odds? Like, why would you risk it when you... When you 
have a perfectly fine advantage going first against this deck. Maybe uh, he made the same strategy in his first round. Uh, we know that round one, he played against Will yeah. Chalice. Uh, he might have even discussed the match afterwards with the player he was facing. Right. And uh, that World Chalice player perhaps says, oh, yeah, if you play against World Chalice and you get to choose, tell them to go first because they will have sided incorrectly. Or <laughs> Just imagine there's a group of World Chalice players and they're all bending together and they're like, hey, if one of us loses and the opponent is asking us how to play against us, this is what we're going to tell them. <laughs> and then they, they set up their friends for, for success in the future. <laughs> <laughs> so Michael's going to go to his friend after that first round and he's going to just high-five him. Like, hey, your, your erroneous advice has now paid dividends for me. <laughs> <laughs> the World Chalice Secret Society. <laughs> yeah, they have to band together. Maybe they have like a, a secret greeting or something on top of all the other things. They have like a, a little sticker with like with like the, the gigantic tree on it or something. <laughs> all right. So so much for conspiracy theorists. They also get their money's worth in this coverage this weekend. This deck is not the quickest. It's, um, are you often running into troubles with, with the time in, in World Chalice? Um, I haven't actually played the deck myself. I've seen it go a few times, and yeah, the combos take a little while, but not notably any longer than the Gouki boards that hmm. we've seen being assembled. Okay. I think uh, save for Christopher Nielsen and his oh, yeah. wow. machine gun firewall <laughs> dragon, <laughs> yeah. the Gouki combos have all been taking eight, ten minutes. To right, yeah, Christopher Nielsen assembled the entire Gouki board in five minutes yes that was that was pretty pretty big yeah from the start of the tom timer oh, to there's a there's a big twin twisters that's that's a really good twin twisters here uh hitting the light stage together with the set card with the it was an engage is that correct yeah, yeah. very strange it looked like uh christian might have been trying for some kind of bluff with a mech knight or something but setting the engage why, why wouldn't you go first with the light stage and resolve it and then I, I don't know. It, it feels like Christian was trying something clever and got punished. Yeah, that backfired. And now he's left. He doesn't have the search. He doesn't have engage anymore. He does have scapegoat, though. And then Candina, which gives him another search. Um, Just by activating that Candina, the Widow Anchor in his hand has been uh, completely yes. switched off. There's a Drollin Lockbird for Marco. Drollin Lockbird also turns off the light stage. Now only... The scapegoat and the draw and lock alive for Christian Langer. Scapegoat, of course, can't even be activated this turn because mm -hmm. he's already normal summoned Candina. I don't think Christian Langer can play any card in his hand right now. Wow. Talk, talk about a lockdown. Yeah. This is... Uh, the only thing that he could do is set back row. He could technically activate the light stage and take no search, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't recommend it. And um, Marco Perico seems to, to also indicate that with his movements. He's like, yeah, I think this turn is over. Yeah, yeah. you want to do something else? And it's, it might not just be the turn that is over. It might actually be the game and match that is over. I it, think this is a lock for Marco. Yeah, if, if Marco doesn't find the, the damage here, I would be extremely surprised. Uh, he's unlikely to be able to finish the match. We know that there's a scapegoat set for uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Christian. So the ability to wall off a lot of damage is there. But just because you can prevent that damage from happening doesn't mean that you're in any better position to actually come back and win the match. Yeah. He did draw into a Twin Twisters. Um, now got World Legacy su <laughs> Succession. I'm getting better at it. Still early here, guys. The effect of Ningursu is going to force out the activation of that scapegoat immediately. Unfortunately yeah. for Christian, you can't chain to the resolution of Ningursu. He's missed his opportunity to play that card. Yeah, and the judges... I mean, it seems like Marco has already pointed that out, and the judges are just doing the same thing. And that means suddenly there is real OTK potential on Marco's side of the field with that scapegoat being sent to the graveyard with, with no effect, basically. Yeah, uh, if Christian knew fully the effect of Ningursu, he should have responded to the activation rather than waiting until Marco indicates that that is the card he's choosing to send to graveyard with the resolution of the effect. 
Yeah. So suddenly that makes a very big difference. Yeah, this is absolutely game over here. So that's uh, Marco Perigo is basically on the victory lap after a very long marathon, and he only has to bring it home. Yep, let's, Christian let's smiling with the smile of a man who's already lost the game. Yeah. But it's it's a life lesson in, in World Chalice, um, so I guess some some would appreciate that. It's like, a, at least it's a, <laughs> it's a cool way how you get taken out of the tournament. And um, got to give it to Marco Perico with with his, his deck, really. Puts a stamp on it, shows everybody what it can do. Yeah, just double checks the graveyard. There's nothing stopping him from dealing a lot of damage. And um, that should be enough. Yeah, that yeah that's is plenty. enough. That's uh, oh. 16, 25, 22, yeah. and another 25 for the Ngersu, which is close to 9,000. Yeah, they're delaying the inevitable. And in just a second, we're very likely going to see a handshake. Playing it down by the book, these two. Oh, are we missing something? We're not There's missing no something. There's no reincarnation. There, there is and the, the handshake. Is over. And that is it. Marco Perico. The winner of YCS Bochum ends up winning round number nine, the first match of the second day of the European Championship in very convincing fashion. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I definitely was, say very convincing. It took a little bit of time just because the combos mechanically, there's a lot of stages to yep. go through, but he was dominant for both games there. And he shows just how he won that uh, largest ever European tournament and Looks like he's marching on again here. It seems like less of a surprise now, now that you've seen this. All right, guys, let's. Pr we, we promised you some stats, so let's look at those. Maybe let's start with the con... No, oh, maybe not start with the country breakdown, which you think it just killed our entire app here. Um, let's look at the deck breakdown then. This is the initial deck breakdown at the start of day one. Um, it's less about the total numbers, it's more about relative numbers. Just keep in mind, Sky Striker Trickster is in first place and it's, it has a 2-1 to one lead to everything that comes after it. And on top of that, everything that comes after it is, is pretty evened out. It's, it's not like there's a clear number two, there's a clear number three and so on. No, these decks that come after it are all in relatively the same terms. Now let's look, let's compare that to round eight. Uh, one big difference is that we have a lot less other decks, so the the rogue decks got kicked out of competition, and now we do have a clear number two with Goki. Yeah, and I think we saw Goki actually moving up the ranks there. It wasn't even in second place, exactly. let alone a clear second place. Exactly. And uh, Sky Striker Pure, and like the other interesting thing here to note is that all the other decks staying in the same position than they were before. Uh, Burning Abyss made good. They went from 68 up to 34, whereas Pendulum Magician went down from 76 to 34. All of that doesn't really matter because it only tells you what people were playing at the end of day one. Now let's look at the start of day two. This is today's metagame. And that is even more different than what we had at the beginning and also what we had at the end of day one. The other category continues to shrink. More and more of the rogue decks are getting taken out of the field. Um, Sky Striker Trickster still has a respectable lead. Goki is um, solidifying its second place, I would say. Yeah, and I, we've seen some slight changing over at the lower end of the list here. Burning Abyss overtakes the Pendulum Magician. Altergeist mm -hmm. overtakes the True Draco. So it's, it's Altergeist, Burning Abyss up, and True Draco, Pendulum Magician down by the looks of things. Exactly, yes. It's, it's only a few numbers, so uh, if, if two or three players are getting taken out, it already looks different, that picture. So, but, but for the f for the most part, we see that the most popular deck is, is able to keep its position. Uh, Goki is staying in second place. It's not moving up in terms of relative numbers. Um, it's only that the popular decks are moving up in relative numbers in comparison to the rogue decks. So yeah. rogue decks do not seem to be the best choice for this weekend. But that is a, that is a general statement when you're talking about all the rogue decks together. There might be some particular rogue decks. We, we heard about some mermaid players that were doing well. We uh, also heard about uh, hero players doing well. Uh, yeah, there's been a very interesting hero deck that uh, I've heard about yesterday. has been 
performing exceptionally well, yeah. and I'm 60, hoping that we'll 60 cards. Yeah. And the problem is that the player decided to put his name on the no-fly list, as I like to call it, so he doesn't want to get featured. So yeah. we're, we're not going to see him in the feature match, at least not until the later stages of the tournament. Yeah, I'm very excited to see what of these more interesting decks is going to make it through to that top 64 card. Right. So let's hear it from the champion. Let's take you guys to the analytics desk where we have a little bit more statistics and, of course, some first-hand insights into World Chalice. Let's take you to Luke and Matt. Thank you very much, Oli and Thomas. We are here with Marco Perico, our winner with World Chalice. Not, not just for this feature match, but <laughs> our, our YCS Bochum winner. Just winner, winner in well. life in general, right? Yeah. <laughs> You're doing well. So tell us, how was that feature match for you? Yeah, the the feature match is always cool to be in the feature match. Uh, it likes it helps you to focus more on the game because you have no other people around you. Yeah, yeah I really enjoy the feature match always. Yeah, I think a lot of people kind of have the, the the two mindsets to it of, you know, I honestly would prefer the feature match because it's much more quiet up here yeah, than, it, yeah, than yeah, it is I agree. out with all the people. I mean, yeah, but but if, uh, you feel more the pressure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, which is good because you, as you say, you focus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got your own personal judge as well. If you've got any questions, and oh, that. Yeah. it's like the VIP <laughs> treatment. Yeah, yeah. You have two judges, in fact, yeah. nowadays. We, we are, and more, even more people watching the match, so you know that people are going to be paying attention to it. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Do you have a particular play that you made today, uh, uh, yesterday, or this morning? No, not not particularly. Like I know that they're like almost perfectly. Yeah, misplay can happen because you get tired during the day. Sure. But yeah, no particular play to mention. So yeah. it seems like your preferred setup at the start is having the firewall connected with Ib and Nightmare Goblin with a face-up defense mode, World Legacy. Well, well, Chalice World, World Legacy. World yeah. Chalice World, Ch World Legacy. Uh, can you talk us a little bit through why that's your preferred setup and how that's sort of um, helping you win your matches? Uh, because basically, uh, in the meta game. Uh, there are a lot of cards that targets like uh, Widow Anchor, yeah. After Barnas, and something like that. I know many players are playing uh, Trickstar uh, Sky Striker, so they for sure run that. Also, it prevents uh, your firewall to get destroyed by Goblin or by being targeted by Unicorn or something like that. And also, the War Legacy is good because it's a good interruption for Exodic monsters uh, like Topologic Bomber Dragon, that is an issue for my deck because yeah. uh, it's like. Uh, Quick dark hold. Yeah, you can say that. Yeah, it's actually. I think uh, a lot of people forget that effect because uh, the World Legacy card has so many effects. It's the summons two guys from deck. Yeah, it, what Chinese monster um, as many effect except yeah. for the Vanilla monsters? <laughs> yeah, you have to play a couple of Garnets, but uh, they they all do something. Because we saw your game one, your opening hand looked abysmal, and it's like I oh, got Mystic Shine Ball in there, and just your normal. Uh, also the Garnet. Yes, and the Garnet, and you still turned that into an Ingressu draw two cards. Yeah. We see these cards being played, um, well, we see Ingressu being played in a lot of decks as just spot removal, but it's even more brutal in this deck when it's just giving you more resources to combo off with, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, all the Vanilla monsters are good because they always go for Rimduk. Like, even if you draw Garnet, you can still have a play. Uh, the only yellow monster that is not that useful is Driver because you can't normal summon that. Yeah. But it's really good to push for game. Well, with the Firewall Dragon, we saw you yeah, uh, dropping yeah, that a little bit later. It's like, oh, don't worry, this uh, 2500 guy is yeah, going to get me it over the line. It's absolutely so easy. That's a lot of attack points, really, yeah, isn't yeah, it, yeah. in today's meta, yeah. So let's talk about game two. Uh, you must have sat there with like the biggest grin on the inside when he said, yeah, you go first. And you're like, okay. Yeah, I wouldn't expect that. Uh, probably he cited a lot of hand traps because it, they are very popular these days. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think it's, uh, it's a good option because if you don't draw any hand traps, Basically, you lose. Yeah. As yeah. we saw, you got into your ideal setup. In fact, your setup in game two was even better than your setup in game one. Yeah, you had even better. Firewall just giving you tons of cards back as well. And then you're also doing the ingress. Yeah, also, because uh, I summon Venus, it gives you so many monsters to link summon. Yeah. Too much advantage. I, I was able to draw fear out out of Ninjutsu, and that's the biggest play that I can play. So a lot of people, with the, when they're playing Venus, uh, consider Exodius um, the ultimate. For, is it the ultimate Forbidden Lord? Yeah, the ultimate Forbidden Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you have uh, you decided to not play that this weekend. Why, uh, does it not really add anything to your deck? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I think that Exodius is really good uh, in meta that, in meta games that in which you have to grind. Yeah. Like in matches that you that last like uh, ten turns or something like that. But in this meta game, you just go with watch eyes. You just go for your board, and then if it doesn't kill that board, you win the following turns. Yeah. So 
I, I, I don't want to say a lot of people, but some people may be questioning, why did you decide to go with World Chalice instead of Goki? <laughs> I always say, like, World Chalice is a better Goki. Okay. <laughs> That's actually really funny. I yeah, bet cause... all the Goki players are saying yeah, the other day. Even if I lost two, two Gookies yesterday. Okay. <laughs> uh, but because, like, Goki is, is uh, more known than World Chalice. Like, mm -hmm. people uh, know people know how to play against Goki. Yeah. Like, they can settle all their end traps, uh, while when you get against World Chalice, you don't know what to do, like what to stop or something like that. In fact, my yeah. opponent this turn, like, didn't ask my World Legacy to add, that gives me basically a Monster Reborn. Yeah, I, I didn't see that, yeah. If you're not uh, comfortable against that deck, you're gonna lose probably. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that's a really good way of thinking, that if, if you, you know, play something that you think is just as powerful as another deck, but is less known. Then yeah, the, yeah. those kind of break points that they can stop you with hand yeah, traps. Yeah, opponents are that be... are not able to to play against my deck, they give me the biggest advantage I can take. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So since you took World Chalice all the way to the finals of YCS Bottom and yeah. winning that, and you're doing so well here, did you manage to stock up on a few extra copies this time, just for profitable trades yeah, after the event? <laughs> why not? Hopefully, I will get them. You got like seven World Chalice decks just sat at home waiting. Just like, oh yes, eBay is gonna love this. Uh. <laughs> so I, I'm wondering if you'd be interested in your your win rate. So uh, yeah, of course we I quickly am. we quickly sneaked it in beforehand. But yeah, so 78 percent. Yeah, that's good enough. That's, that's 39 it's games as well good. that you've uh, got on record as yeah. well this season. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, Marcello only had about you know just over 80 percent last year. Yeah, that's so pretty high. 78 is is pretty high, right? Yeah, uh, I mean. It, in my opinion, 80% is the limit between like very good players and something that Between God and <laughs> regular player, 80% is insane. <laughs> yeah, 80% is really, really high. Yeah, so that's I think you are really, really close and hopefully this tournament can bring yeah, you over. Have you been on World Chalice the entire season? Yeah, 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 I always so play the deck. So that's 78% on World Chalice this Only season. World Chalice, yeah. Wow. Since that's it was released uh, with Code of the Duelist, I think, yeah. I always play that. Of okay. course, I changed the decks uh, for the meta games and... I'm yeah. so happy, because when I when I originally got the, to show Link something off in the office, the first deck I did that with was World Chalice. It's uh -huh. like, okay, so you do this, you do this, you end up with Firewall, and you attack the game. Yeah. And it's the very first time I showed them. And it's I really like, enjoy playing World Chalice. The community sort of never really picked up on it. It was just like, ah, oh, there's other stuff we can be doing. So yeah. I'm really happy that World yeah, Chalice Yeah, you have is. to invest a lot of... T a lot of of your time to know really well the deck. Yeah. yeah. Also, deck building is very important while playing World Chalice. Yeah. So something really interesting for, for Marco is that if you have played World Chalice the whole season, then your your win rate is far higher than the win rate of World Chalice players in this tournament because that's only forty two percent. Yeah. So you're double. performing above average by by quite quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know what's with World Chalice. Yeah, I think it's pretty good. Like, maybe the time you have to invest it is a, a very big obstacle. Probably that's the, the main problem. So it's it's win rate against um, Sky Striker Trickstar. We actually had a look before the, before the match. Is it dead on 50%? Uh, that was mine or that no, was... No, no, that is based on everything everyone. in the tournament. Ah, in like, general. every oh. time they faced off, it's bang on 50-50. I thought it, it was higher. Yeah, it's it is now. Yeah, it is now. It, yeah, it is now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I thought Skystroker tricks are at like at least 65 percent because, yeah. in my opinion, it's the best deck in this meta game. Yeah, there's actually a bunch of other other kind of Sky Striker versions. Against Sky Striker Pure, it's lost all of its games, but only four games. And then against the Mech Knight version, it's mm -hmm. a 40 percent win rate. So that that is much more like what you yeah. were saying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's quite interesting. And then tr Pure Trickstar, it's flat. No, fifty percent. Fifty percent. What's uh, Goki uh, stats like? Goki uh, forty percent. Forty percent. Yeah. Yeah, Goki is very good in this middle game. It has a really good matchup against Tr Trickstar Sky Striker, but the mirror match of Goki is not that great. Yeah. yeah. Because it's like di dice roll based, in so, my opinion. How do you play against Goki if they go turn one extra link? Are you just picking up your cards with World uh, Chalice? If they extra link me? Yeah. Yeah. Actually not, because uh, in the first turn my my Goki's opponent. Extra link me oh, wow. with Ibli. Hmm. Uh, I crushed Ibli. And then for Mostly Reborn for uh, its home firewall. So I can get the zones for free. <laughs> and then you just uh, link him up and just go, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, now yeah. we can play. I would have won business. that game if I didn't draw Garnet as a six card. Oh. I have a fusion and draw Garnet as a six card. Yeah, yeah, it can happen. Yeah, so you, you have kind of ways to you get have a way of actually yeah, playing yeah, through yeah. and establish Maybe game one, if they start, it's harder. I mean, obviously. But in Post side, I have a lot of hand traps, I have uh, Akaiju. Yeah, I'm pretty confident with it. 
Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for the feature match. Yeah, thank cheers you, for coming best, on. Man. Best of luck in the following rounds. Thank you. And we'll be right back with the next round of Swiss here from the European Championships in Berlin. See you guys soon.